This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Welcome everyone to this uh, second Shandaya lecture at the Institute of Philosophy. The Shandaya lectures are made possible thanks to Dr. Shandaya Shandaya, uh, who is also supporting the Institute of Philosophy and more generally fruitful interactions between philosophy and cognitive neuroscience. So the lecture series have awarded um, several uh, laureates in the past years, but uh, this year we couldn't find a better candidate <coughs> thing to bring together uh, the cutting edge of cognitive neuroscience and experimental aesthetics and uh, very fundamental philosophical problems about mind reading, the putting of intentions, but also symbolism. Uh, in the first lecture we heard from Vittorio uh, how the connection between uh, symbols and his work on art and motor uh, resonance were coming together. But today uh, Vittorio uh, will focus more on visual arts and painting and again trying to show us how big philosophical problems can find some solutions or new ways of being formulated through experimental science. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Vittorio again for the second lecture. Thank you. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Uh, thank you for coming. Welcome. And uh, as uh, uh, Ophelia um, introduced my talk, uh, today uh, it's getting even more dangerous than uh, uh, the previous episode because now we will enter into the uh, attempt to empirically investigate some aspects of uh, our experience of those peculiar images that uh, we now define as artworks. So we will basically cover uh, uh, this in this broader framework, the framework of what neuroscience can tell us about uh, our aesthetic experience confining our investigation to images. So in a way we could uh, frame this enterprise as an attempt to naturalize aesthetic experience. The notion of naturalization uh, is uh, also uh, very tricky uh, for very good reasons. Here uh, allow me to be very, very coarse and crude and distinguish two main uh, uh, approaches uh, to this topic. On the one hand, we have uh, a, a fully cultural approach which uh, maintains that are we dealing with art? It's culture all the way down. And I would like to contrast uh, an alternative approach that uh, some people would uh, define biocultural. Uh, and this approach claims, wait a minute, it's human nature. And therefore, it includes, it may include the evolved cognitive motor perception and uh, emotional hardware that we share cross-culturally. Although I don't like the, the <coughs> notion of hardware. Here is a series of quotes uh, uh, from Noel Carroll. Uh, which I think are very helpful in framing uh, uh, the topic uh, uh, of today, of this afternoon. First of all, we should acknowledge the cross-cultural recognizability of uh, many artworks. It's always easy to come up with one single case which falsifies this, but broadly speaking, I think we are uh, pretty confident that we can make uh, such a generalization. Art seems to have sprung up independently at different locations in different times, and this is uh, uh, empirically more and more uh, validated by, by uh, new findings that are popping up uh, every, uh, every second day. So, Carroll concludes, art is something bred in the bone of mankind. Further interesting uh, uh, features of uh, uh, what we now define artworks uh, is the power to coordinate feelings among people. They attune audience members to each other. They promote cohesion among groups. They enable us to refine and enhance our sensitivities for discriminating the emotive states of our conspecifics. And finally, uh, uh, Carol argues, art helps building social identity. 
because it's one of the most important cultural sites we have for training our powers, for detecting the emotions and intentions of others. Uh, art trains social cognition by modeling and refining mind reading. Okay. It's getting too cognitive for my taste, so I want to um, somehow bring in again once more Tim Ingold in this beautiful book, The Perception of the Environment, he wrote, we can now see how by adopting a dwelling perspective, that is by taking the animal in its environment, he's discussing here what's the difference between a, a, a den uh, 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 built by uh, rodents, I'm missing the English for castor, uh, the animal, big teeth, uh, and uh, a temple or uh, a cathedral. So dwelling uh, perspective enables one to take the animal in its environment stance rather than the self-contained individual is our point of departure. Thus it is possible to dissolve the orthodox dichotomies between evolution and history and between biology and culture. I don't know if we are yet in such a position but I think this is a very interesting perspective, particularly in light of all discoveries related to the big uh, uh, topic named epigenetics, among others. So this is going to be the outline of this afternoon <coughs> talk. Empathy and aesthetic experience, the hypothesis, and uh, some empirical results uh, uh, out of a series of experiments we, we started in order to validate or uh, uh, confute uh, the hypothesis uh, we started with. Let me start with a, a quote from Meyerhold, one of the founder of modern theater, words do not tell everything. And this is an interesting question, which uh, Eirik Wölflin put in his doctoral dissertation, which he later on published uh, as a tiny little book. How is it possible that architectural forms are able to express an emotion or a mood? And the answer Wolfling provides is the following. Physical forms possess a character only because we ourselves possess a body. If we were purely visual beings, we would always be denied an aesthetic judgment of the physical world. But as human beings with a body that teaches us the nature of gravity, contraction, strength, and so on, we gather the experience that enables us to identify with the conditions <coughs> of other forms. So the idea is that there is a, a true bodily relationship that I might establish even with the, with the temple uh, of Agrigento I show you in the, in the previous image. <coughs> so we come very close to the notion of empathy. <coughs> empathy is a mess as a concept uh, and these slides uh, portrays uh, some of the different ways of employing this very same notion. Uh, at times it is used as a synonymous of theory of mind or perspective taking. People speak of cognitive empathy, other people confuse empathy with sympathy, with emotional contagion, with identification and the like. So it is interesting for five minutes to take an historical perspective and see where this word comes from. Actually, it comes from aesthetics, and this is already a very interesting point. It comes from this particular guy. Although the term Einführen was used already in literature, there are, uh, uh, it, it has been used by Novalis and other uh, authors in uh, the German-speaking world. Uh, Robert Vischer is credited as being the first, probably, scholar, philosopher uh, to employ it systematically to refer to a particular way of uh, establishing a relationship with this peculiar object that we now call artworks. Uh, while discussing the relationship that can be established with one of these objects, say a sculpture or a painting, Robert Vischer, in this book on the optical sense of form, a contribution to aesthetics, which was published in uh, uh, 1873, writes, I transpose myself into the inner being of the object and explore its former character from within, as it were. 
This kind of transposition can take a motor or sensitive form even when it is concerned with lifeless and motionless forms. So, formal features of the artwork are very important, but it's also very important the uh, uh, point of view of the beholder. Uh, so, in a way, it's a, a receptive theory of uh, the experience uh, uh, that happens when we behold uh, a painting or a sculpture. Uh, this way of uh, understanding the relationship with the external world, with the world of objects, with the world of other people, uh, is part of, so to speak, the air du temps. And I owe this, uh, in spite of the fact which I read the book many years ago, it totally escaped to my attention this specific uh, 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 point, uh, which was pointed to me a few years ago by Nick Humphrey here in London. It's from Daybreak, so it's 1881, just a few years after Vischer wrote his book on Einführung in Aesthetic Experience. To understand another person, that is to imitate his feelings in ourselves, we produce the feeling in ourselves after the effects it exerts and displays on other person by imitating with our own body the expression of his eyes, his voice, his bearing. Then a similar feeling arises in us in consequence of an ancient association between movement and sensation, which is very interesting. And here is, uh, at its time, a doctoral thesis was specifically on the problem of empathy. And this is a very important point. When, when people talk of empathy, most of the time they confine themselves to the domain of emotion and affect, while uh, Edith Stein is very explicit in making it clear that empathy describes a, uh, a totalizing way of relating to the other, which includes also the action, movements, and behaviors. It's not only something uh, specifically or exclusively related to emotion. So the notion of empathy is uh, finally the possibility to establish a relation of similarity with the other, which heavily relies on action, and uh, she picks out several examples which deal with actions. <coughs> and here is Freud. People normally wouldn't uh, uh, relate the notion of empathy with Freud, particularly because many of the metaphors he uses to describe the psychoanalytic setting are the, the coldness of the surgeon, the empty blackboard, and the like. <coughs> Part of this apparently uh, stems from the fact that the standard English edition, uh, when, whenever Freud used the word Einfühlung, Einfühlung was never translated into empathy. But he wrote that, and this is a very interesting passage uh, from Inhibition, Symptoms and Anxiety. It is only by empathy that we know the existence of psychic life other than our own. So, can we employ this framework as a starting point to understand better what uh, happens when we are facing uh, these kind of objects? By the way, um, it made the big headlines today in Italian newspaper in the official website of the International Expo in Milan, opening soon in April, they decided to, cho to choose Michelangelo's David as the emblem of, uh, but in the official website it was written, Donatello's death. <laughs> you can imagine what happened. <laughs> no one will be fired for sure. <laughs> this is a, a, a quote from a beautiful book, but Siri Hustad is mostly known as a novel writer, but she's an essayist, and this is a, a book on uh, uh, aesthetic experience of paintings, and she writes, uh, mysteries of the rectangle. In art, the meeting between viewer and thing implies intersubjectivity. The intersubjectivity inherent in looking at art means that it is a personal, not impersonal act. So we could, as I introduced this notion uh, uh, in the previous talk, uh, envisage aesthetic experience as a mediated form of intersubjectivity, where the object, the uh, outcome of the symbolic expression is the mediator between 
two subjects. The artist who is not physically present, what is physically present is the outcome of his uh, uh, creativity and the beholder on the other hand. Vittorio, can I just make one point with regard to the David? Yeah. It's a point that was made by Marcel Mauss mm -hmm. in the Pacti du uh, uh, Corps, that people looking at <coughs> sculptures of humans very frequently find themselves adopting the posture yes. of the thing, and they have the appropriate feeling, yeah. or rather, sometimes inappropriate. Right. <laughs> okay. Thank you for this. So, I won't cover this in detail because I did it uh, in the previous talk. So, here, uh, uh, for someone like me, a reasonable starting <coughs> point uh, is the evidence that is uh, uh, suggesting us that there is uh, uh, a form of relating with other uh, human beings, with other individuals, uh, with uh, biological forms that doesn't necessarily require or is uh, uh, fully controlled by a propositional attitude, uh, but that uh, rely heavily on uh, bodily resonance that has been detected in the domain of action, in the domain of sensation, and in the domain of emotion. When I see the body of someone being touched, part of my somatosensory system activates. When I see pain, someone in pain, uh, I activate part of the pain matrix in my brain and the like. Not to mention actions and mirror neurons. So, <clears throat> the idea is that this uh, boils down to a, a, function, a basic functional mechanism of our brain which enable us to establish a relationship uh, uh, beside, below, in spite of the more cognitively sophisticated tools that we develop to uh, entertain relationship with other individuals, namely uh, language. So the hypothesis. Here in the Mac world, there should be a picture of David Friedberg that the Windows world erased <laughs> for some <laughs> mysterious reasons. Uh, I read the book. David Friedberg is an art historian. He is a chair of art history in Columbia at Columbia University. He wrote a book in the late 70s, 80s called The Power of Images, where he was strongly arguing uh, in favor of a major role played by emotions in our relation to artworks. In an uh, aesthetic world uh, which was totally focused because also of the development of conceptual art on the uh, propositional aspect uh, of artwork contents and uh, uh, aesthetic experience of those very same artworks uh, Counterintuitively, uh, uh, in a very inactual way, he published this book which said, uh, saying, by relying on an old tradition in aesthetics, uh, emotion play a major role in our uh, uh, experience of artworks. So I um, became very interested in his perspective. I contacted him, I invited him to Parma, he gave a talk. Uh, we decided to write a paper that finally got published uh, uh, in 2007, where basically in this paper we, we, we propose two hypotheses. This is the first one, which I found, well, not trivial, but I mean, I thought we were putting the old wine in a new bottle, because there was a huge literature that then uh, experienced a sudden stop on, on, on the role of the body in aesthetic experience. A crucial element of aesthetic response consists of the activation of embodied mechanism encompassing the simulation of action, emotion, and corporeal sensation. These mechanisms, though socio-culturally modulated, are supposedly universal. And this basic level of reaction to images, the hypothesis uh, was arguing, is essential to understanding the effectiveness both of everyday images and of works of art. So we, what we tried with our hypothesis was to introduce uh, a sort of aesthetic epo epoche. So to put into brackets the artistic nature of the images of artworks and consider artworks as images qua images. 
So in the first place, an artistic image is an image. So being an image should share a lot of features that all images should display and therefore should generate reaction in the beholder that no matter what the aesthetic status of the image is, we should be able to demonstrate. That was our starting point. But before showing you the empirical result, I would like to spend a few minutes on a scholar which I consider a hero for a variety of, uh, of reasons. He has been defined the founder of a science without name. And I use it as an antidote when I am discussing these topics with art scholars, art historians. We say, why should we bother with science in the first place? Okay? So, the entire career of Abi Warburg was not an academic, and that explains something perhaps, <laughs> was const a constant dialogue with, with science, starting with Darwin. The first thing that interests me in, 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 in Barbo is his idea that a theory of artistic style must be conceived as a pragmatic science of expression. So there are several elements that resonate in the mind of, uh, of <coughs> neuroscientists in this very sentence. But what is very interesting in Warburg is that his uh, entire career would be inimaginable hadn't he read this specific book, which he did when he was a student in Florence, uh, which was the real bestseller of, uh, of Darwin when Darwin uh, um, uh, publish it, the expression of the emotion in men and animals. Uh, Warburg saw in Darwin's book the possibility to enlarge art history to include the transmission of emotions in pictures. <coughs> and uh, in a copy of the book, uh, Warburg uh, wrote uh, finally a book that helps me. Then he, he didn't limit himself to read Darwin, but he was reading all the contemporary physiologists uh, uh, in Germany, this is Richard Semon, and from Semon he took uh, the notion of mnemon and engram. The mnemon is the memory of an external to internal experience, uh, and the mnemic trace was named engram. <coughs> Furthermore, the notion of pathos form, the formula of pathos that in the last part of his career led uh, Warburg to uh, build the Nemozune tables where he was putting side by side uh, uh, artworks uh, belonging to different uh, times in art history, but all sharing some peculiar posture, bodily movement that could be traced along uh, uh, art history. And here you see uh, a specimen of Hellenistic art on the left uh, side of the picture, which is echoed by uh, this uh, a portion of this fresco of Ghirlandaio, which is in Santa Maria Novella in Florence. A variety of bodily posture, gestures, and action can be constantly detected in art history from classic art to the Renaissance just because they embody in exemplary fashion the aesthetic act of empathy is one of the main creative sources of artistic style. And he wrote, at the end of his life, in 1929, these engrams of emotional experience survive as the inherited legacy of memory, determining the exemplary mode, the contour created by the artist's hand, when the highest values of the gestural language emerge in artistic creation by means of his hand. So, this is another example of how uh, the same work of art can induce a variety of uh, reflections in a variety of different fields. This is the Laocon uh, that was digged in Rome in the 16th century, if I'm not mistaken, and there are several books, essays, uh, written on this very same sculpture. I decided to choose uh, two quotes from Eisenstein. Eisenstein uses the uh, Laocon as uh, a case <coughs> example of 
montage and how montage is important in uh, aesthetic experience. He wrote, here the model appears to be perfect both in the phase of external movement, the attack of the snakes, and in the crescendo phase of sufferance, so by the gradation of character's behavior. But the most interesting thing goes on, uh, Eisenstein of Lacon is the head of the central character. The fact is that the lived expression of human sufferance is obtained by the illusion of movement, and such illusion is achieved with a procedure representing the development of sufferance within a configuration he could not possibly show simultaneously. So there is literally uh, an anticipation of montage by assembling in the very same static image details that would normally belong to different temporal uh, 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 phases of uh, what's going on uh, in the mythological scene. Which echoes what Daniel Stern, the psychoanalyst, uh, wrote in this book, The Present Moment, uh, referring to this image of Cartier-Bresson portraying uh, Giacometti in his atelier where he was able to capture, while he's walking, resembling the same posture of one of his famous sculptures. <laughs> so what is the decisive moment? The viewer, it's when the viewer provides in imagination the action leading to the decisive moment and the resolving action. An imaginary <clears throat> temporal contour is added while one watches a static image. It becomes a small emotional narrative. And in contemporary art, one of the best examples that came to my mind, also because I very much like this artist, is uh, Jeff Wall. These are cyberchrome, which are a trans-illuminated, very big picture, two meters by three. And uh, they look like an in, in instantaneous picture taken in the street, while it takes him months to realize these images, which condense in the very same uh, frame uh, images that belong to different uh, uh, a moment in time. So here you have the impression of, literally, of the hand squeezing the box containing the milk with the, with the milk spraying out of it, and this gust of winds you apparently see what happens when the wind blows, but this is actually an image composed of several images that were condensed in the very same picture. So how can we relate that to the brain? What is the relationship between movement and an image, a static image like this? Or when apparently there is no movement, but we if we spend enough time in front of the image, like this video of Bill uh, Viola or Biola, uh, uh, you realize that uh, something is going on because this body uh, uh, slowly moves. The outcome of an action, the static image of an action, uh, leads to the activation of the motor system, even if there is no movement, but imply movement, as this old paper of uh, Johnson Frey uh, uh, beautifully shows. More recently, in Milan, Alice Mado Proverbio, with another technique, uh, um, with EEG, was interested in uh, studying uh, to which extent the degree of mm -hmm. dynamicity in a static image pro uh, uh, um, uh, portraying movement is able to influence uh, 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 the activation of the motor system. And these results show that uh, the more dynamic is the static image of movement is, the strongest is the activation of this circuit, which includes uh, uh, the left uh, uh, premotor and motor areas. So the more dynamic a static image is, the more it drives the motor <coughs> system, most likely, if my hypothesis is correct inducing a motor simulation of what the image portrays. So, this one, one of the key images of my previous talk, the uh, Gombos Cave uh, piece of ochre engraved with this that uh, a community of scholars believes are symbolic uh, traces. 
So we decided to <coughs> investigate uh, writing, confronting uh, handwritten letters, handwritten Chinese ideograms, and handwritten scribbles. The only instruction people got was to look attentively at these images, uh, moving the less they could, in, in order not to bring in uh, motion artifacts, while their brain activity was recorded with a high density EG. Here we only monitor the event related desynchronization. We were studying the new rhythm, uh, which is influenced by motor execution and motor observation, so is considered to be an indirect measure of the degree of activation of the mirror mechanism. And what we found is the following overall, the intensity of the activation of the motor system was stronger on the left side. All participants were right-handed. But what is interesting is that uh, the temporal analysis of the development of the desynchronization, both in the alpha band and in the low beta band, uh, I'm telling this, these details for the neuroscientists that are present in the room, uh, was induced by <laughs> all kind of stimuli. So also scribbles were evoking in our interpretation the activation of the gesture employed to produce them. However, the intensity and the duration of this activation of the motor system was different for the symbols and the scribbles. So the symbols, namely the Chinese ideograms and the Roman letters, induced a stronger desynchronization which lasted longer with respect to the scribble. And there are two possible explanations for that. The, 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 the most parsimonious one is uh, in terms of perceptual familiarity. So we are constantly exposed to handwritten letters, we are constantly exposed to Chinese ideograms. Uh, every, well, if you visit Italy <laughs> recently, <laughs> They are blooming, they are everywhere. Uh, but every scribble is different from one another. So we, we might be familiar with scribbles as such, but uh, we don't see the same uh, uh, scribble pattern uh, as many times as we see Roman letters. Or, or the, the, uh, to be honest, the, the explanation we put forward and that irritated the referee that uh, obliged us to discuss both and give more room to the previous one, the most parsimonious one, is the following. Couldn't it be that all writing styles uh, somehow share some biomechanical uh, feature that can be traced in all written languages uh, uh, and that can be picked up by the perceiver brain even if it's not uh, uh, fluent as the case of our participants in mandarins, and that is, cannot be traced in, uh, in scribbles. Uh, the two hypotheses are not mutually exclusive, uh, but uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the hypothesis that we thought more fascinating should be the role investigating, and I, I'll leave you with these two uh, parallel explanations for this effect, which is nevertheless very interesting. There is a relationship between what is handwritten and the hand representation in the motor system of the observer. So the symbolization process, in spite of its articulation as a progressive abstraction and externalization from the body, the invention of writing, uh, among other things, accomplishes exactly this externalization of meaning keep its bodily ties intact, not only because the body is the instrument of symbols production, but also because it is the main instrument of their reception, <coughs> according to these and other results. Okay, so if you remember the first hypothesis we made with Friedberg, that hypothesis dealt with figurative art. He's a, a, one of his favorite uh, a painter is Poussin. So ideally, the first experiment we could have done could have been to show people uh, Poussin's painting, 
uh, like uh, uh, I don't know the uh, um, the the massacre of the innocents, where there are a lot of daggers penetrating bodies, uh, 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 body captured in a, a very anguished posture, uh, faces betraying fear, anger, terror, and the like. And to be honest, I thought such an experiment would have been trivial, and I was more interested in the second hypothesis, which I introduce uh, shortly. Here there is no body to resonate with, clearly. This is a dripping by Pollock. This is a, one of the most interesting paintings uh, um, I am always spot at the moment, is the Koenig. You really have to stand it in front of it. Uh, I mean, this image doesn't really gives you the dynamicity uh, that comes from it. And finally, these are several cuts uh, by Lucio Fontana. Here comes the second hypothesis. The felt effect of particular gestures involved in producing artworks constitutes a consistent component of our aesthetic experience and appreciation of artworks. This really got me very excited because we could bypass the easy idea that whenever we see a body, there's, there were plenty of examples on the possibility to induce motor resonance by showing static images of moving bodies, but there was no piece of work on abstract art. So we decided to start with Lucio Fontana. However, to show you how little original we always are, and it's always possible to someone to raise the finger and say, well, you're selling old wine in, uh, in a new bottle. And this is part of what I'm doing right now, as I speak, because I discovered this guy, a very poor sculpture, for my taste at least, <laughs> but a very interesting theoretician. This tiny little book, The Problem of Forming Figurative Art, should be read by all people dealing with space and the brain. <coughs> So among other interesting things you may read in this tiny little book is the following. Creation and response to art are directly related. To understand an artistic image means to implicitly grasp its creative process. But even more related to the experiment I'm gonna show you is the following. The aesthetic value of artworks would reside in their potential to establish a link between the intentional creative acts of the artist and their reconstruction on the side of the beholder. Which is exactly what we tried with this experiment. <coughs> so this is a, a famous photograph, series of photographs taken by Hugo Moulas, a famous Italian uh, artist, using photography as a way of expressing, uh, uh, portraying uh, Lucio Fontana in his atelier, right in the act of cutting the famous uh, canvas with, with a knife. This is the consequence of his artist's creative uh, work. And this is the experiment done by Alessandro Miltà, Cristina Berchio, Maria Teresa Sestito with the, the blessing of David Friedberg. Uh, and uh, I didn't do anything but <coughs> proposing the experiment. So all the done was, uh, was done by, by uh, this incredibly uh, good uh, scientist. <coughs> so, we wanted to confront the cuts in the best high resolution image we could get and confront the response of the brain of beholders by showing control stimuli. And control stimuli were the very same <coughs> images of the Fontana's cuts uh, where we removed the dynamic component. So the shade in the canvas, and uh, so the cut is turned into a line with the same length and the same width. So one line, two lines, three lines. They were randomly alternating and the only instruction we gave to our participants was, we're going to show you images, please look them carefully uh, and try not to move, period. We didn't mention aesthetic, art, whatever. 
At the end of the experiment, we showed them the very same images and we asked them a lot of questions. How familiar are you with these images? Uh, which, of, which, if any, of these images do you think is an artwork? Uh, how much do you like this image on a Likert scale? And uh, how much movement do you find in this image? <coughs> so, aesthetic value, amount of movement, familiarity with the image. But only at the end of the experiment, not before. And we recorded the activity and we measured, again, uh, event-related desynchronization. And what we found was that activation in central electrodes on top of the cortical motor cortex was significantly stronger for the original when compared to the baseline and when compared uh, uh, with the uh, control stimuli, the graphic. <clears throat> the shortest the column, the bar is, the more intense is the activation because this is a desynchronization. So, Baseline is high, desynchronization, it, it becomes low, okay? What is interesting is that familiarity with those images was totally unrelated with the result. So we were able to uh, get the very same results both in the students that after the experiment told them, oh yes, it's a Fontana, with, but also in those that never heard of Lucio Fontana and some of which uh, uh, couldn't, weren't able to discriminate as an artwork the original from the control stimuli. Same identical effect. They were activated equally, no matter what the familiarity with the image was. Here's another way of visualizing, poorly because of the bloody conversion to Windows, uh, the same images. We also recorded uh, uh, the activation of the muscles of the hand and muscle of the shoulder. The very same muscle that you would normally imply to make a cut on a canvas while they were looking at those images. No activation. So the observer cortical motor activation doesn't lead to muscle activation. That's why I think I'm entitled to speak of motor simulation. So alpha suppression is only evoked by the observation of the written artwork. It is independent of stimulus familiarity. And I would not like to make a big point out of it. But incidentally, <coughs> I tell you because it's part of the result, aesthetic judgment was higher for the original artworks regardless of the familiarity, OK? Which probably deals with the dynamicity of the stimuli. Let me be very explicit on this. Had we shown cuts on a canvas done by myself, we most likely would have get the very same results. So I'm not claiming that we are measuring the artistic quality of those images uh, and related to the intensity of the motor simulation they induce. What I'm saying is that that cut, that in the hands of a psychoanalyst, which was a question I was asked, showing the very same data to an audience of psychoanalysts, uh, what the hand, that's the vagina. <laughs> that was, OK. So I'm not claiming that uh, this is an artwork because it induces. Uh, <coughs> and as I told you before, I think the strength of, of, of the hypothesis we put forward with David is just consisting in bracketing this the artistic quality of the image, which is clearly driven by the canon, by where we are in art history, by a lot of spurious factors. Today we celebrate, or better, many people celebrate Jeff Koons. Maybe in 20 years uh, he will be put in the basement uh, of the art galleries where he is uh, at the center of the stage. And someone who is in the basement uh, will be revered as a great uh, uh, newly discovered artist. So uh, it goes along with time and the evolution or involution of uh, our aesthetic uh, uh, taste. 
What is important is that in spite of the polysemic nature of these artistic images, those images have some qualities that systematically uh, awaken a bodily reaction in the beholders. Our point is that those bodily reactions that we are studying uh, with the tools of cognitive neuroscience are an integral part of the aesthetic experience and cannot be left <coughs> out of the aesthetic debate, period. Okay, that's the aesthetic judgment, uh, which is stronger for the original, no matter what the familiarity with those images was. So the cuts are the visible trace of goal-directed movement, therefore they activate the reliable motor areas in the observer brain. If you monitor what's going on in the occipital lobe, there's no effect as the one we could detect on top of the motor cortex. Okay, and this is a paper which appeared in parallel or immediately before or immediately after, which is interesting because the liking of uh, real artworks, according to this paper, is influenced by the motor practice that participants were undergoing before uh, being shown uh, the paintings. So if you are trained to do stroking movements, versus uh, uh, st stippling movements. If you do the stippling movements after, you, you like more sera and pointillism than if you are uh, being trained to do stroking movements and the other way around. And so they, they emphasize the relationship between the motor practice and the aesthetic evaluation of the images. If the images were produced with movements, people were trained before being exposed to that. So they, they, make, they, they go one step further than, than we did. So they, they, they want to demonstrate strong aesthetic uh, uh, assumption on the basis of this uh, motor simulation. We were more cautious, perhaps. In this second experiment, no more, stro uh, no more cuts, brush strokes, we decided to study uh, a few paintings by Franz Klein. And we chose Franz Klein because it was easy to build the control stimuli uh, by removing the dynamic component, the dripping, uh, the trace of the brush, uh, preserving the, the overall gestalt uh, and uh, degree of uh, uh, figure ground uh, uh, relationship in the very same images. So again, we alternate those images on the screen. Uh, without mentioning art, aesthetics, liking, and the like. Look at these images, try not to move, recording also with the, um, the high-density EEG net after the, the same sort of question. And this time we also uh, uh, recorded uh, ERP, event-related uh, potential. So we were more interested in a, a richer picture because with ERP, uh, you are able also to localize the sources. EG is very good in the temporal domain, very poor in terms of spatial resolution. With ERP and this uh, uh, almost magic algorithm like LoRa, Loreta, you are able also, with a good approximation, to localize what is the source in the brain of this event-related response that you are, uh, these ERPs that you are recording. So, the observational abstract paintings by Franz Klein was accompanied by activation of premotor, motor areas, reward-related orbitofrontal areas, and uh, prefrontal areas. So a huge network portrayed in these images. So the motor component is <coughs> most, most likely due to the motor resonance. So you don't resonate with a cut, you resonate with a brush stroke, okay? Then you have a richer picture because here we see the, the, the whole brain activity and we were able to localize activation in the orbitofrontal cortex. The orbitofrontal cortex uh, is uh, a part of the brain which is definitely reward related. It pops up in a variety of tasks, some of which also relate to aesthetics and Samir uh published papers where he was able to detect activation down there 
And then we have the, the prefrontal cortex. I was forced by, by the PhD student to, to write that we interpret this in terms of uh, some cognitive part of the uh, uh, beholding activity, <coughs> in spite of the fact that we didn't ask any question, we didn't ask for an aesthetic evaluation, and these images were on for a very short time, two seconds. Nevertheless, this is a common canon, as I told you uh, uh, in my previous lecture, it is a, a common wisdom that the further you get in, into the frontal lobe, the, the more cognitive it gets the elaboration taking place. And so the most cognitive part should be the, really the tip of the frontal lobe. And indeed, <laughs> according to a lot of research, uh, this is uh, uh, what many people believe. Anyway, uh, to be honest, I don't know what the hell is going on in this uh, uh, prefrontal cortex. Uh, most likely is something related uh, to the person in relation to the image. But I don't want to speculate because uh, I, I have no answer, really. So the reviewers were happy with our interpretation. I was sure that nobody would uh, raise the finger. That was the less controversial part of our paper, as it turned out to be, indeed. So the artwork becomes the mediator of the motion the motor and emotional resonance, which is, can be established with, between the outcome of the artist's creative work and the observer, and the sensory motor and affective component of the stimulus processing represent the most direct fruition levels, allowing the beholder to feel the artwork in, in an embodied manner. Conclusions, <coughs> I'm done. The idea is that on the basis of what people wrote century ago, what we more recently hypothesized, and on the basis of the empirical evidence I show you this afternoon, I think I'm entitled to propose you this conclusion, that embodied simulation is relevant in generating the peculiar quality of the embodied scene as that plays a significant role in my aesthetic experience when I'm looking at these images by bracketing the context where I am, if I'm in a museum, uh, if I know who the artist was, blah, blah, blah. All it's the aesthetic experience, as I told you uh, in my previous lecture, is a manifold. Part of this manifold is the bodily part I've been dealing with so far. And therefore, this is, too, an important ingredient of our appreciation of human symbolic expression. And I want to finish with a, a, a very non-actual consideration <laughs> from one of the founder of what people for a while believe could be a science, physiognomy. Lichtenberg, our body stands in between our soul and the external world, mirroring the effects of both. Thank you.